Hey everybody, Tom coming to you this week. I want to talk about Albert Camus, his fantastic book, The Rebel, which I had actually intended to come to you guys earlier with this book, but it took me a bit to get through in virtue of um, what I would say is a high quality density. It's actually not an a especially long volume. It's right around 300 pages, but uh, his treatment of abundance of material sort of really merits a uh, more graduated pace in proceeding through it, or gradual pace, as it were. In any event, you know, what is the question with which he is dealing in this text? Again, the rebel, um, or I believe in French, it's uh, l'homme en révolte, the rebel or man in revolt, right? Um, and it's perhaps helpful to know that in a substantive way, it's a sequel to another work of his called The Myth of Sisyphus, in which he deals with the problem of suicide, the question of whether life is worth living if there is no appeal to some sort of transcendent entity, uh, such as God or the like. And in that work... Camus affirms that life is worth living because it is, in fact, um, the condition of existence itself, which at first blush sounds somewhat uh, of an empty reply, but to flesh it out more, what one realizes is that to be in a position where one might consider suicide is already to be in a position where certain values are being affirmed and to be serious about the instantiation of those values you have to be alive <laughs> now i mean there's a kind of uh, syllogistic quality to that analysis which might lead one to uh, dismiss it as um jejune or an adequate I think that that is really just an unfortunate side effect of the conveyance of that argument in a in an abbreviated form. When you read the myth of Sisyphus itself, you don't come away with that impression. In fact, go ahead and check out the book, or even just go ahead and check out a rather, rather famous passage within the book in which he reflects upon Sisyphus proper, to see what I intend by that, or what he intends rather by that, which is you know very simply the notion that while life in its grandeur can at times be almost unspeakably challenging, it is also precisely absolutely worthwhile to engage that challenge. Now, the problematic which emerges from the uh, manner in which things are framed in the myth of Sisyphus centers around the question of value, a question which assumes a more pointed aspect for Camus in the wake of, you know, World War I and World War II and the emergence of the Cold War. Uh, the rebel emerges in 1950, right, when these things are sort of coming, coming out, uh, you know, and, and just sort of making their implications uh, inescapable <clears throat> challenging implications as to uh, issues of human nature issues around the role of violence in our own lives and, and, and in history and uh, there's a concern that uh, one encounters a contradiction in that in a country such as the Soviet Union where you have a revolution which Trumpets values of radical egalitarianism on one hand while becoming complicit in terrible uh, avenues of despotism on the other. You have that situation which tempts one to call in question whether there's anything more than uh, surface value 
to those latter values and those latter calls um, in, in a sort of more intense way of putting the matter is the indictment of the revolutionary heritage from, say, the French Revolution through some various moments in the 19th century up to the Russian Revolution and the revolutions of the early 20th century. And the concern is that this revolutionary heritage is so spattered by blood as to call into question whether they necess the, the, the revolutionary aspiration necessarily departs from the values which it invokes to ground its legitimacy. Um, you observe join that concern, that indictment, with the aforementioned question of value and how do you ground value to value life? And what are the implications there? So, hardly, uh, hardly easy questions. But Camus suggests that we can take encouragement from the attitude of the rebel, especially when we consider the rebel in the moment, the primary moment, the primary gesture or act of rebellion, because that act has a twofold quality upon which we can rely to redeem the aspiration for a better world. For on the one hand, to rebel, as Camus says, is to draw a line to establish a limit beyond which one cannot go. And in the articulation of that boundary, renouncing relationship of master and slave, a relationship in which one human being dominates another or another human being is servile to another. And in the wake of that tension, declaring that we can relate with each other along a fundamentally egalitarian line, working together as opposed to at odds. It's a reimagining of that power complex and in a reimagining of that complex an affirmation that we can move beyond where we are today. Now various facets are worthy of noting. One being that especially when it's thrown into this light it becomes quickly clear that the act of rebellion is not a selfish act not an egoic act. Rather, it's an act of intense solidarity with all human beings and declares the liberation really not just of the oppressed, but also the oppressor by pointing to a way of being human which is freed of the suffocating implications of existing within that master-slave dyad, famously explored in various ways by Hegel and others, right? That's one facet which, you know, is utterly worthwhile. You know, the, other, the other facet is the implication of that affirmation for the question of violence and how uh, that comes to ramify for this plane of life on which we are living. Because indeed, for the act of rebellion to be truly grounded, it has to be connected to a sense of valuing all human life, and per really even perhaps all life, such that uh, the idea of simply exhibiting an attitude of uh, destruction toward any particular human being after an absolutist fashion is taken off of the table. If not, you know, I mean, but then, you know, the, the, the counterpoint there is it seems like you, you arrive at an untenable position in, in the face of, of actual force or violence. Um, 
So what Camus is, is that the, what's really creating the impression of a, of a problem here is that there's a, a grave temptation to treat the situation in absolutized terms. And that tendency to absolutize can proceed along various trajectories, two of which I might point out here. One is a tendency toward, in the light of this problematic that we've cited, the problem of violence, or if you want to invoke a sort of old, a uh, different way of putting it, the problem of human evil. Uh, if you sort of approach the matter after the fashion of uh, utilitarian calculus, or after the fact, well, that maybe not, let's, let's withdraw that because he doesn't explicitly, well, address utilitarianism, but I'll say along the lines of privileging the historical, privileging the world in material terms, and rejecting an appeal to a value which is beyond the historical and the material. What happens is if you take that tact, then everything becomes a question of expedience, expediency, which is tantamount to saying that everything comes down to a question of force. Who is capable of exerting their will with more effective violence? This is a non-starting position. Because it doesn't, you don't have to look too far into it to see that as soon as you fall into that trap, you have actually fallen out of faith with the fundamental ground of rebellion, which is uh, an insight that uh, violence is, especially in that unmitigated way, is not the answer. The other line along which a sort of absolutization can occur is an appeal to a transcendent principle after a fashion which leads to quietism. Um, a kind of quietism which in certain moments can be uh, strangely brutal. You know, this is, this is what happens in, with lots of eschatological thinking, where it's thought that we can find a justification for our behavior, not in this world, but in a hypothetical next world. Whether that next world occurs at the moment of our individual death or at the end of some, you know, designated point in time with an Armageddon or an apocalypse of a variety, uh, according to one's taste, in any event, you have... Rejected responsibility to the present moment. And it is in the present moment, again, where the real vitality of rebellion is to be found. So, those are just two lines of analysis, which I'm sort of abbreviating, found in the text. You really need to read the book to appreciate the really oftentimes ingenious manner in which Camus... Uh, illumines how this happens through a series of uh, explorations of literary figures and historical moments. Now, how does one respond to this dilemma? Well, one way, crucial way to respond is to realize the need for moderation really a somewhat inadequate word. Camus is really calling on a more uh, ancient Grecian value which indicates that the genius really emerges not to paraphrase F. Scott Fitzgerald by holding on to one extreme or another but by existing right in the middle. You can think of Aristotle in this connection as well. He says we need to recover a faith in a fundamental intelligence which is able to abide at that point. And to abide at that point is to learn to live with a kind of tension and a recognition that a formula is simply not available which is going to resolve the problematic which is put forth before you. What, what, what is the 
practical upshot of that? Well, there are a few practical upshots, right? Um, and a few, uh, which I'll just sort of quickly sketch here that he cites, is that uh, one place we can look to find moving expressions of living in that freedom is, is, is the, the arena of art, real art, which seeks to participate and engage with reality in a fashion that does not compromise by falling into one extreme or another, but which captures the challenge of the moment and the ability to meet that challenge after a fashion which calls us into a better world. So art is one moment. But then, you know, there are questions of political moment. And here, there's a lot more uh, space for work to be done. Uh, in terms of, you know, what Camus offers explicitly in this text, there are three, um, three, three things which he, to which he gives great uh, emphasis. One is, you have to have absolute, if there's going to be any absolute, going to be an absolute freedom of speech, right? There has to be possibility for dialogue without constraint. Because as soon as you introduce some kind of coercion into the situation, as soon as people are pushed into what's really a barren silence, then the next moment is a moment of the kind of violence rejects the the original hope of the rebellious in, uh, impulse, which is a hope of freedom and solidarity and justice as being terms which could ultimately be brought into accord. Another, and this is connected intimately to the first point, is an utter rejection of capital punishment. That's it. Boom. Guillotine on the guillotine, right? No more, no more executions, because they cannot empower the state to end people's lives. Because to do so, again, for obvious reasons, is to suggest an account of how we can relate with each other, which is simply incompatible with a higher end, a further end. And then the third thing, which is, I think, worthwhile, is um, that he suggests promising trajectory of a trade unionism, which is really a reimagining of how we relate with our work, the workplace, hoping that we can ultimately do it in a manner which doesn't leave us in constant bondage to uh, monetary imperatives. Now, uh, we go on for there. <laughs> Obviously, there's that's just sort of like to open a whole hallway worth of doors. But, you know, there's a whole array of conversations that we can have in the wake of, you know, just this enumeration of certain crucial points which emerge in the text of the rebel. And I'm hoping that I've whetted your appetite sufficiently that you'll go out to get a copy of the text and you'll engage it yourself. And even if you don't read the whole thing, do yourself the favor of at least reading Introduction, the first chapter, and then the last section, which is entitled Thoughts on the Meridian. That's sort of where his theses, if you like, are given most explicit treatment. But it's, it's really absolutely doing yourself an enormous favor if you read the whole thing, uh, between, including the sections on metaphysical rebellion, historical rebellion, his analysis of rebellion and art, and the tension between rebel, uh, rebellion and revolution. And ultimately, it's an incredibly encouraging work, which points to our ability to you know, deal with what the universe has confronted us <laughs> with, uh, part of the dangled preposition, you know, at, at any point in history. Certainly at this point in history, 
there's no shortage of significant challenges, uh, environmental, economic, political, and so forth. And it certainly would be easy to slide into a certain despondency. And, uh, and, and in that respect, uh, I think we can take uh, great courage from Camus, who you know also was emerging from an interesting time as the Chinese uh, sort of curse would have it, right? There's the other thing, may you live in interesting times. Uh, you're living in interesting times, and so did he. And I think he, uh, I think he got a pretty good read on how to deal with those interesting times. So uh, hopefully uh, you'll check it out and determine on your own by, by your own lights whether that assessment is valid. So, this has been Tom Lin talking about Albert Camus' fantastic book, The Rebel. Uh, check it out, and I'll catch you guys next week. Ciao.